current amperage and resistance um, pressure drop. So there's parallels, just conceptual parallels between steam and electricity. So steam is distributed at high pressures and high temperatures. So again, uh, we have different numbers. So what does sensible heat mean? Sensible heat, as it relates to the steam table, is the amount of heat required to raise one pound of water from its freezing point, 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, to its boiling point, which is 212 or 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, sensible heat changes the temperature of a substance. At zero PSIG is 180 BTUs per pound of sensible heat. It's simply the temperature of boiling point, 212 minus the freezing point, gives you 180 BTUs per pound. And at 100 PSI, a lot more sensible heat because it takes more energy to get to that higher temperature. So 330 minus 32 gives you roughly 309 BTUs per pound. So graphically, this is what it looks like. You have temperature on the y-axis, which is your vertical line, and heat energy down here on your BTUs or kilopascals or kilojoules, whatever, no, sorry, kilojoules or watts, whatever term you're using for heat energy. We're just talking about the concept here. So down here you have the freezing point. Up here you have your boiling point. To get from here to there, that's your sensible heat. So we've raised the temperature. The sensible heat raises the temperature. The latent heat. No, latent is another word for hidden, so it's like hidden heat. Hidden heat or latent heat is the amount of heat energy required to bring one pound of boiling water from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. So if we go back one slide, right here we don't have steam yet, we're just bubbling boiling water, so we haven't changed phase yet. Latent heat is when heat is known to be added or removed from a substance with no change in temperature, only in change of state. So we're going from the liquid phase into the vapor phase. Latent heat is the workhorse of steam. So when you're taking steam and you pass it through a heat exchanger or through a coil or through a jacketed vessel, we're giving latent heat from the steam to the process. And when steam goes, uh, what I, exactly what I just said. So your latent heat <coughs> is this point here. So notice the temperature doesn't go up, we're just changing phase. So um, in theory, we're 100% saturated, and this is what a boiler tries to do, is try to get to that point. Unfortunately, no boiler is 100% efficient, but what we're trying to attain is this point here. And then we, when we bring this steam into our process, we give up this heat and turn it back into liquid, which is what we call condensate. So steam condenses and turns back into a liquid, a hot liquid that we call condensate. <coughs> Which brings us to the topic of flash steam. And flash steam is one of those tricky concepts that some people understand and others don't. So we'll go through it a, a bit and talk about flash steam and uh, what flash steam can cause or the consequences of having flash steam. So flash steam occurs when condensate at higher pressure flows to an area of lower pressure. Excess energy causes some of the liquid to flash back into steam. So that's the term flash steam. It can cause problems, can cause vapor lock in some types of traps, can impede <coughs> drainage in undersized piping. Large volumes can increase the velocity leading to water him. So let's use an example, a flash steam. So we have our high pressure system at 100 PSI, and as we saw from before, 100 PSI will have 309 BTUs per pound of sensible heat, 880 BTUs per pound of latent heat, and at zero PSI, we have 180 BTUs per pound of sensible heat and 970 BTUs of latent heat. So notice the big d drop or big increase in latent heat as the pressure drops. The lower the pressure, the more efficient it is to run a process. So you have to match the temperature requirements with the pressure that you're using, but also bear in mind, the lower the pressure, the more efficient it becomes. If condensate from 100 PSI steam passes through a steam trap with zero PSI pressure at the outlet, this is what occurs. We have the 309 sensible heat of the higher pressure minus the 180 of the lower pressure divided by the latent heat of the lower pressure gives us the amount of percentage of condensate that's going to flash back into steam. So as soon as it goes from one pressurized side to lower pressure, 13% of it is flashing back into steam. 
So graphically, this is what we're showing. At zero PSI gauge, 14.7 atmosphere, we're at boiling point that everybody knows is 212 or 100 Celsius. At 100 PSI, we have more sensible heat because the temperature of steam or water is much higher at that pressure. So 309 minus 180 divided by 970 gives us 13%. So if we had um, 1,000 pounds per hour, we'd have 130 pounds per hour flash steam and 870 pounds per hour of liquid condensate. So this is the difference between flash steam and live steam. So this trap, the steam trap is leaking by, it's no longer holding anything, so live steam is just blasting right out. Um, you don't, sh don't see it so well in this um, graphic. Uh, it's just a little bit of steam vapor as the trap discharges. So don't get confused between live steam and flash steam. The effect of flash steam on condensate piping. So the volume of flash steam is much greater than the volume of liquid, even though the mass of liquid is greater than the mass of flash steam. So just let that sink in for a bit. The, there's far more volume, there's far more liquid than there is flash steam in terms of mass, but the volume occupied by the liquid is much smaller than the volume occupied by the flash steam. So what's that going to cause us? So for example, we have our uh, jacketed vessel, it's a food plant. They're making some kind of product in this kettle. We're using steam in the jacket to heat up this product. We're running at 60 PSI gauge. The steam turns back into condensate, goes through our steam trap, and we're dropping down to zero PSI gauge. We're going into a vented receiver. So the uh, condensate tank is vented to atmosphere. If you go from 60 to zero, 10% of the liquid is going to flash back into steam. So that means 900, uh, 100 pounds of flash steam, 10% of 1,000 is 100, of course. And then the remaining is still liquid, 900 pounds. But the specific volume is occupied by the liquid is 15.3 cubic feet compared to 2,680 cubic feet. So if you see, we have one, like 1% 1 of the, 10% of the volume and 90, uh, volume of the mass and 99% of the volume. So the volume occupied by the liquid is very tiny compared to the volume occupied by the flash steam. Which is to say you need to size your condensate return lines based on the amount of flash steam, not with the amount of liquid. So if we size the condensate based on the amount of liquid, two gallons per minute, we'd end up with a half inch return line. We size it on the flash steam, we're f half, three quarter, one inch, four pipe sizes bigger with one inch, inch and a quarter. Undersizing the return line will lead to excessive back pressure, erosion, and water hammer, and who knows what else. So flash steam recovery, typically we go into a flash tank, and this is what a flash tank looks like. It's just a vertical tank, and the flash, high pressure condensate drops into the tank. The flash steam bubbles up, goes up towards the top, and the liquid drops down into our steam trap, so the liquid can be sent back to the boiler plant. So in our example here, we're taking this flash steam and supplementing a low pressure system. Uh, and then when, when there isn't enough flash steam for our low pressure system, we got our PRV feeding steam from the boiler plant. So this is just set to say 10 pounds. This might be a little bit higher. When the flash steam can satisfy the pressure, the amount of steam from the flash steam is enough to satisfy our requirements and the PRV stays closed. But if we drop in the amount of flash steam sending the low pressure system, then that PRV opens up and starts supplying uh, plant steam to our system. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll put in a back pressure valve. A back pressure valve is simply a reverse acting PRV. Acts very much like a safety valve, but you don't want your safety valve popping all the time because that wears your safety valve and uh, it'll start chattering and leaking by. So instead of using your safety valve, <coughs> add in a uh, sec secondary valve, a back pressure valve, which is set to slightly below the pressure that we re would require, and it vents off excess flash steam when we don't have a use for it. So one way of recovering flash steam is to use it in a low pressure system directly, but we can also quench it and use um, either a heat exchanger 
or spray nozzles to quench the flash steam and turn it back into liquid. So we have these package systems here. We made a flash steam, or sorry, flash tank mounted on legs on skid, condensate pump and steam trap built right in to sh uh, ship that to the site. Fewer connections to be made by the contractor and the installer and made it easier. So you can either use flash steam recovery directly or use a heat exchanger of some sort or uh, spray nozzles, as I mentioned, to, to quench the flash steam. The problem with flash steam is that uh, everybody's lies light up and say, oh, we can save all kinds of money, it's easy to calculate. But the problem is you don't always have a use for it. You don't know what to do with it. For example, if you want to run unit heaters or heating coils of some sort, in the summer, what are you going to do with that flash steam? So there's always that question, you don't have a constant use of the flash teams. It's so sh sure part of the year it's, you're saving money, but the rest of the year, what do you do with it? So that's, it can be a little bit tricky at times when talking about flash steam recovery.